If everyone gave away one, two percent, it would rock the world. Uh, born into an apartheid uh, society until 1964 and 65. 85% of black people had no protection in this country. People who made that change, and there are a whole lot of people who did these things. And I think we all are the beneficiaries, and we all should be making this country better. Stages of freedom uh, takes my time. We sell rare books to raise money for our, our swim program. Everybody should be able to learn how to swim. And a lot of kids can't afford it, and they're scared to be around water, or they want to get around water. So it's incumbent upon us at the Y to use our skills, our pools, and our ponds to train people. But it's even more important that we collaborate with people like Ray who go out and solicit vendors to underwrite these programs. You can never quantify how many people don't drown because of people like Ray Rickman. It takes uh, $100,000 a year. We work with eight YMCA's. The goal is 500 young people, most of them African-American, learning to swim this year. People don't think of that's health care, but... <laughs> Looking at the Zoom meeting, I'm like, what is this? The most joyous thing you can imagine. You can, you can barely walk and you can go into that water. Welcome to State of the State. I'm Darlene Durezzo, and tonight I'm in conversation with Ray Rickman, the 2018 recipient of the Frederick Douglass Underground Railroad Legacy Award. I went to receive my award at the African American Meeting House in Boston. This is a national award. There were hundreds of people they looked at and they gave it to me for really 40 years of civil rights activity. I've known Ray for about 17 years now. He hired me to work on a project with him and that project uh, was about how to support healthcare in some of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, Ray had um, discovered that there was a massive brain drain of doctors leaving many of the poorest countries in the world, in particular in Africa. He wanted to do something about it. And so together we spent the summer doing research and we identified four countries in Africa, Mali, Malawi, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And we decided to build an organization called Adopt a Doctor uh, in order to support physicians in those countries in, in an effort to reverse the brain drain. He traversed the state of Rhode Island, raising money, building up this infrastructure to uh, provide financial support for dozens of doctors working uh, in this part of the world. In subsequent years, uh, we also got passionate about uh, healthcare and well-being closer to home here in the United States. In 2005, we created a nonprofit organization called Shape Up Rhode Island. It was a uh, social grassroots campaign to bring Rhode Islanders together to support each other to lead healthier lifestyles through physical activity, healthy eating, mindfulness, and, uh, and weight management. And we went around and with raised support, uh, raised capital, connected with community leaders. We brought on employers from across the state and we were able to build one of the best and greatest grassroots movements that Rhode Island has ever seen. Over 10% of the adult population of Rhode Island participated in this program, and in the process, they changed their lifestyles, they lost weight, uh, many of them reversed chronic conditions, and they improved their longevity as well as their quality of life. And I wish everybody had a memory, because since almost all of us have gone on the same road at different paces, uh, we would have more respect and be more respectful of each other if we had no Don't tell you where to start. I would say that Ray is one of the most talented, creative, and compassionate people that I've ever met. Uh, this is someone who wakes up every day thinking about how to make the world a better place and what actions he can take to actually make that happen. Hi.
All right, Nick, get in here. So at your end, there's a button you need to click. Nick's going to explain it. On the uh, the screen share, you have to, uh, you have to press optimize for video clip. Hi, I'm Lynn Jackson. Hold on a moment. Co-script writer and musical director. Hi, my name is Mike Volker. If you give me host rights, right? I can. You could screen share the video yourself. Is the only thing you could do. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for Ray. Are we ready? You think we're good? I think so. All right, I think we're we're all set here, Ray. Uh, my uh, six foot three foot father was the chauffeur for Mr. Ray White, and Ray White was the executive vice president of General Motors. Uh, he ran General Motors. On July 4th, something awful happened, but on July 2nd, uh, my father went to a dealership and bought a 1958 Lincoln. Uh, he did that every year. He, turn, he would turn in the old Lincoln and buy a new Lincoln uh, for Mr. White. And he liked to do that because he got 20% off plus 20% off. So he get the car for you know sixty percent of what other people paid. This was part of his job. It was fascinating. On July fourth, we went to our annual family picnic. About eighty-five of us, all my aunts, all my uncles, my great aunts, everybody, and you know sixty kids. I went to this fabulous event. About six o'clock, since my sister uh, Anne had gone to sleep four or five times. And my little brother Bernard, little bitty brother, kept going to sleep as well. My mother decided to get a ride from her brother, my uncle Johnny, and we went home early, leaving my father at our family picnic. So off we go. And uh, as we're going in the door, Lily Bridge, this is Detroit, Michigan. Into the door we go. It, the telephone is ringing. We have a big black telephone and it's ringing and I run and answer it and it's my great aunt. And my great aunt is screaming, uh, get Bet oh. Lee on the phone. Uh, Bet Lee being my mother. And I, I really didn't understand what my aunt was saying, thank goodness. My mother gets on the phone and she's on the phone about two minutes, tears run down her face. And she takes her four children and puts us on the living room couch. We're never permitted to sit on it. For anyone on this call of a certain age, you remember when people had uh, living room couches and they had plastic over them and you could only sit on them when company came. Yeah. So this was very unusual for us to uh, be able to sit on the couch. The Maybe a minute later, my mother came back and she said, your father has died. Uh, she came back in her summer duster. Duster, again, for those of a certain age, you don't know, but it's a summer coat. Yeah. It's, it's a coat, Rob. It's a coat you uh, wear when you don't need a coat. And at that very moment, my other uncle uh, arrived at the front door and um, tears in his eyes, tears in his eyes. Out he goes. 
sits on the stairs. My mother comes out. He takes her by the arm, and off they go. Off they go. All of this, um, uh, Roger. You may want to mute everyone, please, so that there's yeah. no distractions. Is that the one, or you can focus on the other one. This one. Am I the co-host? Yeah, mute all. Uh, yeah, mute all. Where, and then, where am I clicking right there? What does that say? You need, no. Who's, am I the co-host or is Chris the co-host? Oh, Lord. I just want to hear Ray. Roger is the host. I made him that right after the video. So he has control over that. He just needs to make sure he doesn't mute Ray. He's, he's, he's running down there to do that now. Yeah. Yeah, make you the you gotta make me the host. <laughs> okay, you want me to uh, wait, Rob. So Roger's in control of that. I have no control now, Chris. All right, Roger. Are we successful? Yeah, there you go. Wanda, if you can mute for us, that'd be terrific. Um, I'll do my best. Just click this. Should be at the lower left of your uh, screen. There's a microphone. And just oh, yeah, it's muted. Okay, here we go. So my uncle's sitting on the front stairs, my other uncle, my uncle Peyton, and he's crying. And I'd never seen a man cry like that before. Off my mother goes as my great aunt comes in, tells us, wash your face, wash your face. She keeps saying it. That's all she'll say. We all go wash our face. And she goes and says, wash your face again and go to bed. As if we could wash away the pain of it all. Three days later, we went to my father's funeral. It's a fascinating endeavor at the Diggs funeral home, my first funeral ever. I don't remember anything about the funeral except my father's Jewish friend, Mr. Weinstein. He kept saying, uh, you know, Jews and people of the Islamic faith go early to the grave. He must have said it five or six times. I decided that day, this is one of my first interesting cultural religious experiences, I decided uh, that that you should go early to the grave. After the funeral, Ray White, my father's boss, who, as I told you, was executive vice president of General Motors, drove his own car over to our house, came in, had some lemonade, and gave my mother the keys to the big, new, week old Lincoln. And he said, this car is worth $7,000, Betty. Do something with it to help your little family. And off he went. My mother called up my father's Jewish friend, Mr. Weinstein, and he came two or three days later. And they went and met a real estate man. And they went to see a house my mother wanted. My mother playing the maid. My mother's playing the maid because Blacks could not buy houses in that neighborhood. And uh, she sees a house she likes. She taps Mr. Weinstein. She's in the back seat, and she taps Mr. Weinstein on the shoulder. And they get out, and they go in the house, and they look at it. And Mr. Weinstein says, I like this house, because my mother's told him, oh, this kitchen's great. That's the sign that she wants to buy the house. And uh, so Mr. Weinstein says to the realtor, uh, we want to buy this house. And the realtor says, uh, tell me your name again. He says, Weinstein. And he said, are you by any way, are you Jewish? And Mr. Weinstein says, yes. And he says, I hate to tell you. And he pulls out, he, he says, hold on. He runs out to the car and he brings back a map and he shows it. And it's a map put out by the United States government. It's a redlining map. And Jews and blacks and Latinos can't buy houses on that street. And he shows it to him. He says, it's not me, it's the US government. And he says, oh, 
My mother's shoulders drop. And the realtor says, come on, I'll show you something a block away. And off they go. And there is a house, four bedrooms, two baths, bathroom in the basement, really quite nice house. And it's only $10,000. And my mother, <clears throat> the maid, taps Mr. Weinstein on the shoulder and says, it has a nice kitchen. And so that's how we got the house at 1469 Garland in an all white neighborhood. Now, we don't have time today to tell you about all the turbulence that went on with this black family, cute black family, uh, moving into this all white neighborhood. I will tell you that uh, I learned a lot of uh, Lithuanian, Estonian, uh, German, Polish, Greek words because the Irish priest came and taught us a bunch of phrases. And each phrase that it says, don't hit me. I'm one of you. And that's what we would say to the white kids up down the street and in the neighborhood when they got ready to beat us up. And it worked about three out of four times. Uh, don't hit me. I'm one of you. And I tried to say that in uh, Polish the other day, and I don't think it came out right. But we had about 12 of those phrases. In September, Remember, this is all in July that this has all taken place. Now it is September, and my mother takes us up the street to register for school. And the principal says, um, can you come back tomorrow morning? I heard that you were in the neighborhood. Now, that's the euphemism for, you know, I heard some colored folks have moved in, Negroes or Blacks or whatever he was thinking. And so the next morning at eight o'clock, we show up and the secretary sternly tells us to sit on the bench. And I thought at the time, and I'm a 90 year old kid, and I thought that bench was 40 feet long. It turns out I went 20 years later to look at it and it's only 12, 13 feet long. But anyway, I'm on the end of the bench all by myself looking out the window and up comes a black limousine Lincoln Continental, just like Mr. Ray White uh, had, and that I was used to. And out of it steps a black chauffeur, walks around the front, opens the door, and out of the car gets the superintendent of the schools. Now, I didn't know who he was at the time. And my father didn't have to open the door for Ray White, so I thought it was quite a little uh, endeavor but he comes in and he walks up to my mother. The principal uh, is leaning out the office door, never comes out. And he says to my mother, Mrs. Rickman, tomorrow at 7.45 a.m., a school bus will drive up to your house and take your two children to school about three miles away where Negro children are welcome. My mother says not a word to him. The next morning, Earl, the bus driver, shows up. We get in. He buckles up. I've never seen anybody buckled up before. This is before people buckled up in cars. But he uh, buckles up my little sister, front seat opposite of him, and they become good friends. I set five seats back and, you know, because, you know, I'm a little man. So anyway, <laughs> off we go to school. My mother has taken... Uh, the day off of her uh, from her brand new job, which she's only had three days, first job she ever had in her whole life. And um, she takes it off and she goes down to the Detroit Urban League where the NAACP and the ACLU representatives are, and they discuss a lawsuit. And in the federal court we go, there's no uh, jury, just the judge. And the judge puts me on the stand. They have to give me a little pillow. And uh, <laughs> he asked me a few questions. I've been well prepped by the ACLU. And I tell him um, that I want to go to the school three blocks away because it's convenient, because it's nicer than the one they sent me to, because, because, because. I say all the things I was told. And by the way, I believe them. My sister, she couldn't be on the stand, not because she was seven but because she liked Earl the bus driver so much that she wanted to continue to go to the all black school, uh, even though uh, it was an act of racism 
which she didn't understand. Then the superintendent of schools is put on the stand and he keeps saying, it's not him. It's not me. It's not my personal beliefs. I'm only carrying out the policy of the school board. And he must have said it eight or nine times. Finally, the judge gets irritated and says, the policy of the school board is not good enough to permit you to practice racial discrimination. And that's what this is. And I will give you four days to inform the principal, tell the teachers, let the students know, and send a, home, a letter home to the parents if you want, all I care, that these two nice little Negro children, nice Negro child, will be attending your school next Monday. And that's how we got into school. And the uh, ACLU lawyer, young lawyer, volunteer lawyer jumps up. I love to tell people this. He's about 27 or eight years old. It's his first federal case. And he jumps up uh, in the courtroom after the judge uh, gives the uh, demand order. He jumps up and he says, I won, I won, I won. The judge looks at him like he's gonna have him arrested. And then um, the judge adjourns and he comes over and he kisses my mother and he hugs my little sister and all the NAAC people and everybody's whatever. And then he turns to me and he says, uh, Mr. Rickman, thank you for being willing to bring this case. Uh, we will now be able to integrate the Detroit public schools. So that's my first civil rights case as a nine half year old, almost 10 year old kid. I was uh, 10 years old about a week later. And it was fascinating uh, to be there in that federal court. And I enjoyed every minute of it. Now that's a case not frightening. There's no violence, but just uh, the classic American attitude in the late 50s, 60s, wait, or it's not me. Uh, we're practicing racism because that's the way it is. So now I want to take you to junior high school. Uh, in junior high school, I went to Foch, Marshall Foch Junior High School, named after the great French uh, general, won the war in World War I on behalf of France against Germany. And uh, we all knew it. And in Detroit, city founded by the French, I, that's hard for New Englanders to understand, but Detroit was French. And um, we had a Lafayette Street and Lafayette School and you know all these things uh, named after French people. And that's the school I went to, General Marshall Hoch. And on the outside, it was stunningly beautiful, but inside, you couldn't tell whether it was beautiful or not because there were 4,400 kids in a school built for 1,200. Can I say that again? There were 4,400 kids in a school built for 200. So after about three or four days, uh, I asked my mother permission to go see the principal. And I wanted to see the principal because what we did for lunch is we had red trays. They were all they're kind of cardboard, <laughs> they were flimsy. And we had these trays and they were uh, too big for some of us. You know, I wasn't a big kid. And uh, you had this tray and you had to stand up in the hall and you had 12 minutes to eat your lunch. And they gave you the biggest sandwich you've ever had. And then a little thing of milk. And that's all you got. Sometimes paper napkin, sometimes you didn't get one. Uh, and the reason it was like that is so you could eat standing up. You could hold the tray and yeah, 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 12 minutes. And then they had a woman come down and she'd take your tray. You've been here 12 minutes and she'd take your tray. You know, go back to class. And it was a mess. It really was a mess. Uh, 12, uh, the, um, so we're uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. And ninth graders can eat in the cafeteria. And seventh and eighth graders, of which I was one, had to eat in the hall. So after a few days, I went over to Gracie Boggs' house, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, excuse me, and James Boggs. And they were famous, famous left wing, hope you know what that means, socialists. Uh, they believed in total equality and they didn't believe there should be any banks or 
They didn't like General Motors. I said, why don't you like General Motors? They paid my father's salary. <laughs> anyway, um, so I went over and they gave me all kinds of tips on how to lead a walkout. The great um, Grace Lee Boggs. And she's written two books. You get a chance to look at them. You should do so. And then I went to the ACLU. Again, this is all with my mother's permission. I'm still a kid, kid. And we go meet with the ACLU and they have a young uh, lawyer, not the one from my uh, earlier time, but they have a young lawyer and he's gone to Dr. King's uh, training. And uh, they uh, show me how to, the 10 things you're supposed to know about nonviolence, non-conflict, uh, uh, avoiding uh, violence and how to roll in a ball and protect your head. Uh, it, it really is quite fascinating. It's an hour long uh, workshop and how not to curse, how not to say anything to the police and never say, I know my rights. They say, please hate that more than anything. You could, you could curse them out and you'd be better off than saying, I know my rights. And so they tell me all of this and then they give me a couple sheets to take home and study and, uh, how to put your hands up so the police can see you have no weapon of any kind. Uh, come with nothing in your pockets, no ink pen, no pencil, no nothing. Don't wear a watch. You know, police will claim you took the watch and try to hit them with it. Nothing. And a cloth belt if you must wear a belt, but it's better to have some elastic in your pants <laughs> to hold your pants. No weapons whatsoever. And uh, very light socks uh, and wear tennis shoes if you can. Anything will be proclaimed as weapon. So again, I, I do this training and then I go to see everybody in town. It's just fascinating. My uncle, Peyton, my favorite uncle, takes me to these meetings. He loves it. And uh, I learn things about how to lead a walkout. I'm going to lead all 4,400 students on a walkout out of this school unless they do something. So after about two weeks of this back and forth with all the civil rights people in Detroit and lawyers and all this kind of thing, um, I go to see the principal and I tell the secretary I'd like to talk to the principal about the overcrowding. I never knew what that word was until then. They told me overcrowding. And so uh, she looks at me like I'm crazy. And uh, like, you're not getting the appointment. You're just a student here. And this is a different time, by the way, in which students didn't talk to principals, my Lord. Um, but the principal comes out of his office and he says, what do you want? He'd heard the whole conversation. And I tell him that I want to uh, talk about the overcrowding uh, in the school. And he says, for nearly 50 years, students have come here and they have behaved and they're better than you. Now that's probably a euphemism for race, but I wouldn't say it in court. And he says, uh, and you can't see me without an appointment. So I say, how can I get an appointment? He says, you can't. And he turns and he closes the door. The next day I take this day off and I go back downtown to see the ACLU and the uh, folks and the like and uh, get final whatever. And a student designs a flyer and on the bottom of every flyer, Ray Rickman, student leader. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all cute and uh, fanciful. And, and the flyer is like five or six different colors. And then the socialists come. This is my first encounter with socialists. Socialists aren't, you know, people tell you socialists are awful people. Well, guess what? Eh. Eh, they're no worse than Republicans or Democrats, as far as I know. But anyway, about 20 of them volunteer, and they're on every corner. These are old socialists. They're all 60 to 75, 80 years old, and they stand on every corner approaching the school, and they hand out the flyers for me. And of course, the principal calls the police, and the police tries to arrest one of the socialists, but they're pretty good at this, and they don't get arrested. Uh, but everybody in the school has a flyer saying that there will be a walkout the next day at two o'clock. The principal calls me in and he has a copy of the flyer and he says, did you put this out? And I said, no, 
which is true. <laughs> Do you know about it? I said, yes. <laughs> And he says, there will be no walkout. You will be arrested if you do. And then they get on the low school speaker and they tell everybody that you will be expelled from school if you walk out. And of course, uh, the socialists, uh, they have a flyer the next morning saying they can't uh, expel 4,400 people. The principal won't have a job if the school is empty. Don't worry about it. And, uh, and then they also hint, they may arrest one or two people, but probably not you meaning eh, they're gonna arrest me. So at about uh, two o'clock, I have a uh, study hall. I go to study hall and exactly two o'clock, I get up and I walk out and I stand under the flagpole outside of the huge yard, Marshall Foch Junior High School. <laughs> it's really quite the school. And I'm standing out there and before I know it, there are 4,000 students in front of the school. And then there are 20 police officers and five or six police cars in a paddy wagon show up and they walk over to me. I have my back to them. I've been told, ignore police. Maybe you'll be lucky. So I ignore them. And the students are as docile as you can imagine. There's nobody saying a thing to any police officer. And they walk up to me and one of them says, are you Mr. Rickman? And I say, yes. I didn't even turn around because remember one of the 10 things, do not make eye contact with police. It angers them. It, they take it as a, as a threat. So I tilt my head and I say, yes, I am. And then at the same exact moment, I put my hands up in the air. And of course they take them and as gently as you could imagine, they handcuffed me with the biggest handcuffs <laughs> I've ever seen. Look, I had to work to make sure they didn't fall off, but they're busy trying not to uh, hurt me in front of these students, I think. And they put me in the paddy wagon, three police officers, and then they tell me, you're going to be charged with assault on a police officer, resisting arrest. They rattle off about five things. And I say, I didn't resist arrest. I didn't. And they said, then they start reading my rights. You know, anything you say will be held again and on and on. And then I realize I've violated two of the 10 rules. I've spoke back to a police officer and I stared at the police officer dead in the face, which is a no-no. And then I can't help myself. You know, remember I'm a kid. <laughs> I just can't help myself. And I say uh, to the police officer, four uh, people did not witness me resist, four officers resisting arrest in this paddy wagon. There are only three of you. And he says, um, the, there's a window with the driver and he looked back and saw you resisting arrest. This is how absurd all of this is, just to share it with you this morning. And then again, I remember my civil rights training, nonviolence training, and I go silent, silent. Five, six minutes later, we arrive at the new Jefferson Avenue police station. And as we get out of the police station, there are uh, eight or nine reporters there, TV camera, old fashioned big camera, and the two, two people kind of holding the camera up and then the, then the news person. And um, as we're standing there, the captain's looking out the, at the back door, um, watching this whole thing. And uh, two other um, TV stations arrive. And at the exact same moment, Black Lincoln, I'm sorry, Cadillac arrives and then behind the two Lincolns and a whole bunch of other people. It's a caravan, civil rights leaders. And uh, Mrs. Boggs is in one of the cars. And of course, Congressman Charles C. Davis Jr. is in Cadillac. Now he's a funeral director as well as a Congressman, you know, two jobs. Those are the old days, Congress only works six months a year and you could have two jobs. But anyway, uh, they all hop out of the car and the media's got the cameras on them and the media's got the cameras on me and the three police officers. 
and uh, again, they've been told, don't do anything rough to me. So they're trying to direct me without appearing to be uh, hurting me. They're almost just barely touching me. Come on this way. And Charles C. Davis says, Congressman, the mayor has instructed you to release Mr. Rickman into my care. No arrest record, no fingerprints, no nothing. Take those handcuffs off. The three police officers look at him like he's crazy. And out comes the captain shaking his head, release him. And off I go with no arrest record, no beating, <laughs> no charges. Uh, Grace Boggs said, uh, that's uh, very interesting to be able to do all that and nothing bad happened to you, um, except you got on the evening news all over the place and front page of Detroit News and front page of the Detroit Free Press, uh, first time in my life. It's a fascinating experience. And that night, 7 p.m., I'll never remember, I'll never forget, I'm sorry, I'll always remember, the phone rings, our, our big black phone sets on a telephone table. Now, most of you are very young and you don't know anything about a telephone table, but <laughs> everybody had one and quite often near your front door. I don't know why you kept the big black telephone there, but I go over and I answer it. It was my job. You know, I'm kind of the oldest kid around and I answer the phone and I say, hello, Rickman residence, is what you said with great fervor. And, uh, the man says, uh, I am uh, Frank Cody, superintendent of schools. May I speak to Mr. Rickman? And I say, yes, let, my, let me ask my mother if I can talk to you. <laughs> this is a mixture between civil rights leader and kid. And uh, my mother, you know, she's there by now and she's shaking her head, sure. And uh, he says, would you please come to my office tomorrow? Uh, and he tells me where it is, 10th floor, uh, 8 a.m. appointment. Please do not be late. I'm a busy man. And you may bring your parents, but no one else. And I lean into the phone and I say, I don't have any parents. I only have a mother. She's a very good mother, but I only have a mother. And he says, that will do. <laughs> so off we go the next morning, my uncle. Uh, Peyton comes in with his truck and he takes us down. He says, you think I can come in? My mother said, no, he already said he doesn't have any parents. No, you can't come. So um, in we go to superintendent's office. He seats us on this really elegant leather couch. And he says, Mr. Rickman, I'd like to uh, make an offer. Uh, if you will uh, withdraw what I understand is a filing in the federal court, be made uh, this afternoon, uh, I will bill you a new school. I said, pardon me? He says, yes, uh, that's what you want, isn't it? And I hadn't even thought about a new school. I don't know what I thought about. I thought about not eating lunch in the hall on a chinzy red tray and bad sandwiches. And he says, um, we will build a new school uh, and your school, uh, you'll have a choice. We'll build it in such a way that people can go to either school and your school will be down to 1,200 kids and the new school is being built for 1,300. Um, will you withdraw the lawsuit? And I paused for a second. I looked at my mother for guidance and then I turned to him and I said, well, Mr. Superintendent, sir, uh, if my lawyers will let me, lawyers with a big S, and I had one volunteer lawyer. It was a fascinating experience. Uh, 18 months later, with a silver shovel, they had gold shovels, all the adults, and I had a silver shovel, dug holes, you know, easy to dig, uh, uh, dig the holes because they put out a lot of sand, dug the hole and uh, boom, had a new school without a lawsuit. Now that was my second civil rights activity and I loved it. Um, 
no beating, no trouble. I might have got a beating, I don't know. Grace Boggs said, the police weren't going to let me get away with that action as easily as I did. So, it was a good day for a 14 year old. Now, I'd like to take you to the third and final uh, story that I will tell you. And again, every word I've said is true. I left out a lot of detail of that I can't share in this short amount of time. I, like every other person in Detroit, had seen the small airplanes fly over going to Detroit Metropolitan Airport. And I'd been to the airport four or five times. My father used to let me sit in the front seat. It's this leather, beautiful soft leather in the big Lincolns and sometimes in the big Cadillacs. Uh, we would take Mr. White to the airport when he was going to Chicago or Cleveland, some someplace close, he'd go to a little airport. Now when he, uh, so I, I'd been there, but I'd never been on an airplane there. And so one day, Charles C. Davis came to our house, Congressman, who I had now met uh, three or four times, and I'd actually met him a lot earlier uh, when he, uh, my father died. Uh, my father was buried from the Charles C. Diggs funeral home, but I didn't remember that because as I told you, I remembered very little about my father's funeral. So he says, uh, well, first he knocked on the door and I let him in. He came in, he sat on my mother's plastic covered couch without permission and I was like, you you know, to myself, you can't do that. You have to be invited to sit on that couch <laughs> on Sunday. But anyway, my mother comes out of the kitchen. She's washing her hands. And uh, he says, uh, Mrs. Rickman, I want your son to go to Mississippi to march with James Meredith in my place. I've been uh, summoned to uh, go on Mr. Meredith's second march. James Meredith got uh, into the University of Mississippi. Mississippi Law School. And later he went on a march to promote voting rights and he was shot and all but killed. Now he was recovered and he was going to make the second march. And um, Diggs told my mother, I can't go. Uh, first, uh, the march is a little too much and I don't really have the energy. Put another way, Charles C. Diggs was a little heavy. He, he was a little heavy, let's put it that way. Um, but he really didn't go because the word was out that they might do some physical harm to James Meredith. And since he was uh, as important or more important than James Meredith, maybe they would do some harm to him. And he was having none of it. So uh, my mother said, you know, I hear that James Meredith may be shot again. And he said, maybe, but probably not. They shot him once, some kind of casual like that. And uh, my mother said, well, what if they shoot Ray? And he said, eh, there'll be a whole lot of people there. Ray won't get shot. And one thing led to another. And finally, my mother said I could go. He embarrassed her by saying, we all have our part to play in the civil rights movement. And everyone should get to the front of the line when they can. And here I'm offering to pay for Ray to have an air. Uh, I'll pay his airfare and everything else. And he can fly there. Now that interests me a lot. Airplane, flying, wow. <laughs> I'd never been on an airplane. And so off I went uh, on the plane. I sat next to a man. Everybody on the plane was white and we're flying from Detroit to Memphis. Memphis was the gateway to uh, Mississippi. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm on the plane. He wasn't very friendly, but he wasn't unfriendly. And uh, about 10 minutes before we landed, he um, somehow asked me what I was, why I was flying alone, I think is the way he put it. 
And I said, I'm going to march in civil rights march with James Meredith. And he unbuckled and stood up and told the uh, stewardess, I need another seat. And I'm sitting next to a civil rights rabble rouser, a radical. And she quickly gave him another seat and uh, we landed, go to training the old hotel and it's fascinating. We train all day and we have a bonding dinner and we sing civil rights songs. Now, Charles C. Davis had told me, stay close to James Meredith. They're liable not to do him any harm. The world is watching. And on top of it, um, they're not gonna do you any harm. And also he said, oh, this is something I learned and I tell this to every black, Latino, Asian, Native American person I meet. Uh, have some friends with resources or social standing or connection. Because quite often black people, I'm just being candid this morning, they will uh, decide to uh, turn their nose up at friendly white folks. And Charles C. Diggs said, uh, they're not going to beat the white folks up because most of these white college kids come from really good families. So um, having been told that, the minute I get in the training room, I see James Ross and he's the tallest and looks like the richest kid in the room. I knew all about rich people. Remember my father is a chauffeur for the executive vice president of General Motors and I learned how to play tennis on Henry Ford's golf course. So I'd seen a lot of rich people. I knew what they looked like. So anyway, um, all of this goes well. Again, the training more intense than the little training I'd had in Detroit on two separate occasions. And off we go to the, oh, I'm sorry, James uh, Meredith comes on Sunday and we have long lunch with him and uh, we're bonding. It's very interesting. And then we off we go on Monday morning to walk into Mississippi to go to, this is Sunflower County, uh, Mississippi. It's hot. And this is the worst place in America to be on a civil rights march. They say, I wasn't in Montgomery, so I don't know. So off we go. And on 10 occasions on the very first day, people try to run us off the road or act like they're gonna run us off the road and we have to move over once even get in the ditch to be kept from being hit by um, trucks and cars. And uh, I can remember James Ross saying, these are some evil white people. <laughs> anyway, I think the 10th time that this happened off into the ditch we go and the sheriff arrests all of us. There are just 21 of us. And he arrests us, and he arrests us because we're trespassing on private property to save our lives from being hit by a truck. And they take us to jail, and they put all the white students in one jail, big jail, big cell, almost comfortable looking. It has a, one bench in it that three, four people can sit on. And uh, then they put James Meredith in his own jail cell. And then they put me in a jail cell across the hall from uh, the white kids. And then the, four, the five or six black kids are in their own jail cell, the other black uh, kids. And uh, they joke with me, uh, this segregation is based on college versus high school and you're the only high school kid. And we just laugh and have a lot of fun. Now, later I find out that they would always decide who they were going to give a good beating to, and they decided to give it to me. Uh, the rule was they beat up the biggest person or the smallest. And there really wasn't anybody big. James Ross was tall, but there wasn't anybody big. And I, of course, was small, weighed about 114 pounds at the time. So they decided they're going to beat me up. And about an hour after we put in the cell, uh, the um, deputies, the youngest two, the ones who look the youngest, they look like they're 19 years old, I'm sure they're 21 or two, they come around and they harass me, 
called me every name you have ever heard. And they string them together. And they've got the inward capability like you have never heard. And it's actually painful the way they curse me out. And everyone keeps saying, don't worry about it. And James says, I'm working on it. James Ross says, I'm working on something. I've been working on something. And about um, 8.30, one of the deputies comes in, he opens the door and he says, James Ross! And he takes him out of the cell and off he goes and he comes back. And before they put him back in the cell, he said, my father's going to get you and me out of here. His father's vice president of one of the big banks in New York. And I say, I think I need to get out of here. Well, about an hour later, the two deputies come and they beat me. They kick me. They do everything you could imagine. And across the hall, everyone starts singing the famous civil rights song. There's, you know, nothing's going to turn me around. I have a horrible singing voice or I would do a little kumbaya, but uh, I'm not going to uh, do that this morning. Then I faint. And when I wake up, I'm being put into an ambulance, an old beat up ambulance uh, by a nun. And I hear her um, say to the ambulance driver, uh, this is working quite fine. They beat up the smallest Negro. I can help you carry him. So she's kind of thrilled that she can help. It's just the two of them. And uh, off we go. And when I wake up, we're at the entrance to a big hospital uh, in Memphis. I'll never forget it. And two or three of the doctors are yelling at the ambulance driver for not having uh, any assistance. And the blood's all over the place. And I'm wrapped in the biggest bandages, looks like a turban, the biggest bandages you've ever seen. Uh, and the ambulance driver's yelling back at the two uh, doctors, uh, you want to trade jobs? Uh, and then she points out that she started as a nurse and that she has some training. And then I'm on the airplane. And, you know, I don't remember much. Uh, but then I'm on the airplane. And again, I will never forget it. Going in and out of consciousness the whole way back to Detroit. Now, um, wham, about two weeks later, on a Sunday afternoon, after church in Detroit, I go to Greater Macedonia Baptist Church. And I mean Greater Macedonia. 2,200 people have come to hear me speak. Well, I am first prayers, of course, by the minister. And then uh, Congressman Charles C. Diggs, he gets up and gives a 17-minute introduction of me, talking about Meredith, of course, and his role in the whole thing. It's bigger than life. And uh, where I went to elementary school and the civil rights case I was involved in and where I went to junior high school, Foch, Marshall Foch Junior High, and the civil rights efforts I was involved in, and then a couple of things I've forgotten, and quite the introduction. And I said, wow, is that me? <laughs> then I get up and I give a big speech to the biggest audience I've ever spoken before, or ever seen, seriously. Then I'll never forget now, this is uh, Diggs, um, just fabulous, wrapping his arms around me and saying, um, this is the civil rights kid. This is the civil rights kid. And all 2,200 people rise in the claim of my work. Then the minister closes. And he says that the night before he had a dream 
And God told him on the telephone, remember we had big black telephones, God told the minister that he should give half of the offering to me for any medical expenses I had. God told him that. Because God told him the civil rights kid needed a little help after all he'd done for us. And Charles Diggs leaned over to me, Congressman Charles C. Diggs Jr. leaned over to me, saying loud enough for the uh, minister to hear. And the minister's a liar. I told him two minutes before the program that we should call you the civil rights kid. I told him that, not God. The minister breaks out laughing and he says to the audience, to the people, God moves in mysterious ways. He spoke to me in a dream and he must have spoke to Congressman Diggs as well to tell us both that Detroit, maybe America now has a civil rights kid. <laughs> uh, those are the three uh, experiences in my life I wish to share with you. Um, they all involve um, police. And I bring that up because we're in the middle of Black Lives Matters, in which uh, numerous hundreds, thousands, millions of Americans are saying on occasion, regularly, a police officers kill Black people, both male and female, when they shouldn't when they've done nothing to warrant it, that it's an evilness. And most white people act like this is brand new, that it's in the summers of the last two and three years that this is going on. But this has gone on since slave time and into Reconstruction and into Jim Crow and into the early 20th century and into the civil rights movement, killing, people shooting James Meredith, assassinating Dr. King. In Detroit, uh, police officers killed uh, young black people for almost nothing or for something that was not anything anyone should be killed for. Uh, in the early 80s, several Providence police officers shot black people for little of, of nothing. Really sad actions in a democracy. And sadly, quite often I've been on the front lines. Uh, I have a series of questions uh, from you. I hope I have them handy. And I'm going to raise the question, then I'm going to answer them. And I, I would almost have preferred a back and forth, uh, but I think we're going to. Uh, uh, worry about the technology this morning. Uh, what can a person do to make a difference? I love this question because I think in this country there are small things, middle things, really big things, and then humongous things, humongous. You can be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and give your life uh, for women's rights, for um, anti-war rights for the rights of black people, for uh, Mexican Americans. I mean, you, you can be a giant and almost all of us have that capacity. It's hard to rise to that level. It takes a lot of confluences to be a Martin Luther King Jr. And there may not be one in my lifetime. There may be one in yours. And I'm thinking lately we need such a person to lead us because leadership is quite often what pulls the glue together. I gave you the example that I went around and figured out uh, with a lot of help how to uh, get a new junior high school. And I wasn't even trying to get a new junior high school. I was trying to get decent treatment for 4,400 black kids in a school. And so a single person can do that kind of thing with perseverance and a lot of help. Determination is probably what it's based on. Now let's go to the low level. I tell people all the time that uh, 
it would be perfectly possible for every single human being to give five dollars to the ACLU, five dollars to Black Lives That Matters, five dollars to Stages That Freedom, five dollars a month. Now, a lot of rich people do this. They give twenty dollars a month to public radio, twenty dollars a month to um, you know Doctors Without Borders, twenty dollars a month to uh, a tree fund and to the land trust. And of course, they give uh, $500 a year to the RISD Museum or $5,000 to Brown University. You just see them doing this into schools they went to 20 and 30 years ago. About 90% of all money in this country goes to elite institutions. I see people give Brown $14 million to create a swimming pool. And I write to them and uh, boom. I asked them if they'd give Stages of Freedom $10,000 to go on our endowment to help our swimming program. And only one out of 10 do they ever respond because most money goes to elite organizations, elite organizations that may or may not need it, but uh, it is very hard. So the very first thing I tell everybody is if you like something, give them $5 and don't tell me you don't have $5 skip the pizza, uh, go to the pizza party and eat the pizza off your five friends plates and give the five dollars to Black Lives Matter. You can do that. That's power. And when they get 500 five dollar little donations, it turns into money. So uh, every December 1st, I give away money. I just sit down and I say, these are 12 groups I like here. And I give everybody $100. If I've had a good year, I give them 200. We have that ability. So that's what I would say to you on the smallest level. I'm uh, only big in terms of doing protests. Um, some people are not going to like what I'm about to say, but I'm only in, uh, big in terms of doing protests when there is an immediate issue at hand because 10,000 people walking around the state house generally gets you nothing, nothing. It may get some awareness of another 100 or 200,000 people, but they're not doing anything. So I'll give you an example of something. Uh, we have the plantations issue on the ballot in November. And last time it was embarrassing of the number of people who voted no, because they believe that black folks were making demands on putting pressure on people. Or I, I, and then they also believe this is Rhode Island, a plantation doesn't uh, relate to us. Well, first, this is garbage. In South County, where many of you live, there were 200 plantations, 100 of them with large numbers of slaves. Now, uh, I want to be technical about this because I'm a historian. The word plantation was created just before Roger Williams, and it probably in about 1620, uh, to reflect on large pieces of land in the New Americas. And it wasn't created to reflect on uh, slave plantations. But within 30, 40 years, uh, those large pieces of land that were given to people were um, slave plantations. And so plantations for more than 350 years, the word plantations has meant slavery and of course in the South. And so you cannot lie, which is what most Rhode Islanders did about what the word plantation means. I hope everybody in the sound of my voice who can vote will vote to remove the word plantation from our um, official government uh, documents and language and as the name of Rhode Island. There's no pride in it. There's no need for it. We all call it Rhode Island anyway. Let's give ourselves a little emotional um, boost and do something for uh, Black people, really. That is so easy within our ability to do. Now, I had a young man who used to work for us on Saturdays tell me how upset he was because he can't vote because he's only 17. 
And I told him, go out and get five people to vote yes to eliminate plantations from our name. That's power you can have as a 17-year-old. Literally, go sit down, dinner tonight with mother, father, older brother, and say, I need you to do this for me. I can't vote or I'd do it myself. <laughs> and every single one of them will say yes. So uh, I've got to move quick because school is going, this class is going to end. Uh, someone asked the magic question about uh, what can you do to expand the dialogue? And I'll tell you, talk, you personally. Uh, in uh, 2017, I went to 17 towns, uh, Foster, Gloucester, all the towns uh, that voted for Trump. Well, 17 of the 19 that voted for Trump and talk to people about race. And 60, 70 people would come to talk with me. And the first question I asked is, how many of you ever had a half hour discussion about race? And one to zero hands would go up. Talk about it. And you can go to Zoom and you can find a workshop every week. Uh, Stages of Freedom will be doing workshops probably in September, a year from now. You can go to Stages of Freedom's website on the front and sign up and you'll get all the invitations for all our cultural programs. And you'll be with us to talk about race either directly or indirectly. Uh, we do a Maya Angelou event every year. It's fanciful, it's wonderful, it's joyous. Subtext, race. How do we mix in a room with people not quite like us? Now that's the other part of what I'm gonna tell you. Everybody who, um, I live on College Hill and you would think in the middle of this city that I wouldn't live on a hill with probably only four black families out of 4,000 adults. There are only four black families. And then there are 6,000 students that live on top of this hill. Many, 20% uh, of them are black, uh, Latino, Asian. But the uh, folks of a certain age of 30 year olds and up are all white. This is a segregated state. It really is. Go to Little Compton. Now, I didn't say there was anything wrong about it because it's how life is. But you got to get out of the bubble. Uh, when I used to do diversity training, I used to tell people the first thing you buy for your four year old white kid is a black doll. Uh, probably boys and girls, and um, you buy uh, books. Uh, I'm told um, our time is up, and I'm really sad about it because <laughs> I wanted to deep dive into some of these things. I've been involved in civil rights all my life, and sometimes I never let a day go by without doing something. Sometimes it's send a five dollar check. Uh, sometimes it is more than that. Talk to the police chief. And I urge you to do the same. I hope you've got something from the time you spent with me today. And may I say to each one of you, uh, please uh, wear your mask, wash your hands, be careful. Be careful and social distance whenever you can and a blessing on your house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rickman. No, no.